Okay, so this week we are going to do a mini canon for characters who don't have very many iterations but have been revamped nonetheless. I was originally going to launch these mini sodes later this year for certain, you know, movie, event, corporate, you know, interest vertical integration type things, but I think, like most people in the last few weeks who saw Mad Max Fury Road, loved Mad Max Fury Road more than I or probably anyone expected to, so we're going to talk about the many portrayals of Mad Max, all two of them. Mad Max is one of those franchises that most of us absorb through cultural osmosis or late night cable reruns, but they were highly influential. Not on the ubiquitous level of, say, an Indiana Jones movie, but the Mad Max movies were big precursors to high testosterone, late 80s and early 90s actioneers like Die Hard, though Max himself is more of a subdued anti-hero type. Neither muscly nor obtrusive, Max Rokitansky is a much more withdrawn sword, getting forced into communities and stories that are not his own, but shit needs to get done, so hey, Mad Max is in town. Four movies and two different versions. The original that made Mel Gibson famous, and the 2015 revisitation starring masculificent grunt machine Tom Hardy. For Mad Max, the canon is a lot more, you know, loose than we're used to seeing in other franchises, continuity kind of being an afterthought. Are the Mad Max movies officially in the same continuity? Well, <laughs> Mad Max is basically a feature length act one. Civilization in Australia is not doing so hot, though it hasn't exactly crumbled either. We still have infrastructure and a police force and biker gangs are flourishing, but you know, civilization still stands. Max and his partner Goose are cops trying to hold the whole thing together. While the name Max Rokitansky has a sort of John McUnconvincing name vibe to it, he's actually named after Baron Karl von Rokitansky, a bohemian pathologist and likely nod to the director George Miller's time as an ER doctor. Max is one of those archetypal best at what he does types. You're a winner, Max! You're on the top shelf! He's good at shooting and better at driving, and in the wake of the deteriorating state of things here in almost post-apocalyptic Australia, he's beginning to fear his darker side, especially after his partner Goose gets killed. Weak. Look, any longer out on that road and I'm one of them, you know? A terminal crazy. Only I got a bronze badge to say I'm one of the good guys. So, does Max get mad? Nope. He goes on vacation. <laughs> Seriously, he is on vacay for a shockingly huge chunk of this movie. If you've seen Fury Road or any of the other two, you know what's about to happen to the wifey and the baby. And the preamble to a wifey getting fridged, which in turn is the catalyst for Max getting mad, is most of the movie. Max doesn't really get mad until the last 20 minutes when the baby gets killed and the wife gets maybe killed. We actually never find out if she lives or not. Max goes on his vengeful rampage, and then the movie ends. Budget being what it was, Max is nowhere near as effective at exacting revenge as he would be in later entries. He gets shot in the leg almost immediately during his rampage, and as a result has to wear a brace that we see in all three of the other movies. Even the exceptionally continuity wonky Fury Road. But given that Max is now mad and exacting revenge on these biker gangs, is he supposed to be the hero? Or even an anti-hero? George Miller was not a very experienced filmmaker in 1979, which comes across with issues of pacing and structure and the simple cliche interactions of the characters, especially between Max and his wife. Plus the budget was basically non-existent, but he already had a good grasp on theme and character. You're bad, man. You think I look silly, don't you? Max's turn to the dark side, such as it were, was the sort of unsympathetic turn you could get away with in the 70s, especially for an independent Australian film that accidentally made a lot of money here in the States. The audience not knowing whether or not Max's wife survives isn't a boo-boo on the part of the filmmaker, but it doesn't really matter. Max has, by the end of the movie, basically given up on humanity, and his own humanity, finishing the movie by roasting one of his enemies, who is, by the way, helpless and begging for mercy. Stop doing this to me. And this is also like a young kid who's the toady of the bad guy, and that's his arc. Max isn't just mad, he's gone. That's not very heroic. But after that first movie, Max more hits his stride in becoming a player in other people's stories. So for the people who complained about that aspect of Fury Road, I have to assume they aren't terribly familiar with this franchise. Mad 
Max the Road Warrior, or Mad Max, hooray, a budget, is where Max, the post-apocalyptic wandering loner, gets set as his archetype. Max gets caught up with this peaceful-ish little community that has some gas, and then the bad guy, Lord Humongous. <laughs> yeah, he wants to kill them to get the gas. Max keeps doing these people favors in exchange for stuff. People keep begging him to stick around, he keeps wanting to leave and is forced to stay. He just wants his stuff. It's a trouble. Look, he said if I bought him back here, he'd give me some gas. No, not stuff is a big theme in these movies. No wifey to get fridge this time, but he does have a cute and extremely obedient, well-trained dog, and you can guess how that ends. <laughs> Max defines himself more in his relationship to his stuff than to other people. In Road Warrior, he's all about gas, and then he's all about his car. Once he finally lets go of the stuff, he finds out that he'd been duped by the very people he'd risked his life to help. Turns out that maybe Max was right to want to go it alone. That was the last we ever saw of him. Stupid, disappointing other human beings. Thunder down. How do I get in there? That's easy. Pick a fight. And now we get to the infamously bizarre Beyond Thunderdome, where once again, Max's primary motivation is stuff. It's a few more decades on after what appears to be a worldwide nuclear war, where in the last one it was his macho car driving, and this one it's his macho face punching and not dying in the face of probably dying. Congratulations. You're the first to survive the audition. In looking for his stuff, Max falls in with the evil Tina Turner and goes along with what she wants until he's basically punished for not being a total monster and refusing to kill a mentally disabled man. Before long, he escapes, barely survives, and then gets thr thrust into this lost boy's nightmare. Fly, Walker, fly! Fly, 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 fly. And he's not thrilled to be here, but you know, whatever, they're kids. So while always with a mind to get his stuff back, once again he's reluctantly drawn into a sort of, eh, I probably shouldn't let these children get killed situation. In the end, Max brings some misfits together, sacrifices his own well-being for some of those kids, and while Thunderdome is the goofiest, it's also got the most complete arc for Max as a character of those first three movies, in that he actually does something somewhat selfless and then doesn't regret it, but at the same time he ends up being alone. Now, for a while, this was supposed to be the last entry in the series, in part for that reason. But then 30 years later... <laughs> Mad Max Fury Road is the hardest to pin down in terms of continuity. Max alludes to having been a cop at the very beginning, but it's pretty obvious that it's been at least a couple generations since civilization fell. Max is now portrayed by Pitbull elf hybrid Tom Hardy, and when we're first introduced to Max, he's haunted by memories and even hallucinations of people he could not save. And no, this doesn't appear to be a clear reference to any of the previous three movies. The most frequent of these accusing dead is a little girl, and she's definitely not in the previous three. So is this his daughter, some kid, yeah, I don't know. There's several other characters who aren't really there in the previous three. Again, in terms of continuity, the thread seems to be... You promised to help us! Don't worry about it. So is this the same Max? Once, I was a cop. A road warrior searching for a righteous cause. Max in Fury Road is the lowest we've yet seen him. At the beginning of the film, he's been alone for so long he's almost forgotten how to speak, horribly traumatized and suffering from intense post-traumatic stress. Where Gibson's Max was controlled, calculating, Hardy's Max can barely keep it together. Part of what makes Fury Road so compelling compared to the other three is the thing that's being fought over is not stuff, like gas and cars, but personhood. For the first half hour, not only is Max stripped of all of his stuff, but also of all agency, strapped to the front of a car as a blood bank for the war boy Nux, under the belief that this will make his blood more adrenaline-y. <laughs> I mean, he is pissed about the whole ordeal, but... <laughs> Mostly he's mad that they took his stuff, namely his car and his blood. But as far as the plot proper, Max is not motivated by stuff ever, as in the previous two, but like Furiosa and the wives, by survival. And the movie wastes very little time getting our heroes to get over themselves and work together because it's just the logical thing to do, because the world is harsh and awful and really hard to survive in, so you better work together, damn it. They don't waste any time being surprised at the abilities of the other. It's just like, oh, you can do the thing, good, do the thing. 
that is surprisingly rare with male and female co-leads. Almost immediately after Max escapes captivity, he gets the shit kicked out of him by a one-armed woman. But there's never any egotistical butthurt about it. And that does set him apart from most action movie heroes. He doesn't need to reassert his masculinity. There's just no time for that. But the real brilliance of Fury Road is the way it thematically examines its own predecessors, especially in regards to characters being motivated by stuff. In Fury Road, the stuff is people. That's my child! I want them back! They're my property! Human objectification is a huge theme. The wives are Joe's property. The war boys are Joe's disposable war fodder. Their unborn children are Joe's property. And Max himself, basically an organ and blood donor, is also property. So while Fury Road is awesome and fun as hell to watch, it's also a fascinating re-examination on the themes of the previous three. Max was never an ideal, more of a fall from grace sort than an honest to god anti-hero. Maybe in the third one, but yeah. But the first three films are more thematically complex than idealizing Max's either running away or violence is the solution to everything approach to masculinity. I don't think it's any coincidence that Nux bears a strong narrative resemblance to the young brainwashed Johnny who Max killed in cold blood in the first movie. Modern Max has zero interest in vengeance, or even comeuppance, just survival. And as a result, we have the highest stakes we've ever seen in a Mad Max movie. And of course, they're talking about sequels, and honestly, I, I, don't, I don't know how they're going to follow this one, as it was very complete. But hey, if we can go from here to here in 30 years, who knows? We will be back next week with a real full episode of The Loose Cannon, which is death. And it's coming, I promise. Hang in there. Thanks for watching. Patreon, Twitter, uh, go see Mad Max Fury Road. You'll love it. And if you don't, I...